I too am absolutely delighted to be here. Uh, the Swedish House of Finance and Nobel Foundation has brought together just a truly incredible audience to be able to to discuss uh, discuss these these issues, and uh, two excellent uh, people to be able to to comment on. Uh, both Ben, with whom I worked uh, during the uh, uh, during the uh, uh, the financial crisis, and um, and Barry, uh, and, uh, with whom I uh, I haven't formally worked, but uh, have uh, been a consumer of his his work. Uh, for many years, because I also do a lot of uh, economic history, and I've been particularly delighted at the amount of discussion of uh, of economic history here. And I actually think that's that's something that's unusual about money and banking. Um, I don't think there are that many other fields where most of the leading people or many of the leading people in the field have actually done some historical work. I think that's that's unusual. I think if you look at like antitrust or strategy or like a whole bunch of other things you don't see as much history and uh, and I think that's just it's a wonderful thing and I think it's unfortunately has not allowed us to be able to see crises better um, but I think it is something extremely important to draw, to draw lessons from and so it's a delight to be able to uh, uh, to, to talk about these uh, these papers I'm going to use uh, some of the, uh, the the filter that uh, that Barry used of thinking about narratives because I think that's that's very much right. If you think about um, uh, the way uh, policy evolves, if you w think about the way uh, even a lot of the, um, uh, the the research evolves, it has to do with different narratives, different approaches. What do you emphasize? And uh, and I modified a few things in my my talk based on some of the discussions from yesterday because I'd love to see some more discussions of a few uh, of a few issues. So what I'm going to do is try to talk a little bit about some uh, the different narratives and responses for the Great Depression and uh, the most recent financial crisis, and uh, and try to draw a few a few lessons from that. So um, I think um, whenever a shock hits, you just want to who do you blame? Who do you put the the, uh, the finger? Uh, who, who do you point the finger at? Obviously, a lot of people pointed the finger at the bankers, and uh, that was true back in the uh, the old days. Um, there were these congressional hearings in 1933 that were run by Ferdinand Pecora, um, who was an expert at this new media, which was the radio, that got to people directly. We are now sort of experiencing something similar with. Um, people in, in Washington be able to access individuals directly through Twitter. Um, there were always intermediaries before. Uh, certainly that was true back in the, 19, you know, in the teens, but by the 20s and 30s, you had direct access. Um, Roosevelt used that very, very effectively with his fireside, fireside chats, and we're seeing something similar today. And, um, and so the blame was clearly put on the bankers. They were manipulating, they were engaged in fraud, they were uh, enriching themselves, and so the result of that was the separation of commercial banking and investment banking, because the bankers who had, uh, were taking advantage they didn't use these terms, but taking advantage of the asymmetric information that they had about uh, the firms and where the economy was going to sell bad stuff out to uh, poorly informed people and get uh, risky loans off of their books by, uh, by issuing these, these securities to, uh, to people who weren't that, that well informed. Also, there was uh, blame on, uh, on Fed's monetary policy. Uh, obviously, Milton Friedman is one of the great... Uh, uh, and, and Anna Schwartz, the people who sort of pointed the finger of blame. I'm pointing at Ben now. Uh, that shouldn't uh, that, that <laughs> enough enough people pointed at uh, at, at Ben as well as uh, all of us at the uh, in the, the the most recent crisis. That I shouldn't be doing that. But um, uh, but people did point at the Fed monetary policy, and obviously that's been extremely effective at changing people's views. It's hard to believe that before Friedman's book. Monetary policy was a sideshow. It wasn't taken seriously. Now that's the thing that everyone focuses on, and that re really a conceptual change uh, that completely changed the narrative. Barry has focused on uh, the uh, the international aspects, the gold standard, and uh, his analogy of gold and fetters is very effective because you say that and you know exactly what Barry means. He means that the gold standard was a constraint that didn't allow central banks to respond as well as they otherwise might have and uh, interfered with their ability to uh, uh, to respond to the, the Great Depression. Um, apologies to, uh, to Olivier, but uh, in, in the U.S., when we're never sure who to blame, we always blame the French. And so there have been a number of papers that have been about, well, why did the gold standard not function properly? Because the French weren't playing by the rules. And so uh, Barry and Doug Irwin have, have done some work on that. Then there's the, uh, the responses. So um, to the bankers, we have the structural separation of Glass-Steagall uh, that I had mentioned. 
Basically, no one else in the world did this. It was unique to the U.S. during that time period. Uh, we introduced deposit insurance. It was much earlier than virtually anybody else. And um, one of the things that helped to cause the crisis was we had these restrictions on banks being able to branch. And so we had a lot of local... Um, basically, it was like someone had read a, finance, a modern finance text and said, how can we make the banking system as fragile as possible? Make them take all local... Uh, 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 local risk and not be able to diversify that out geographically or really in any other way. We didn't do that. We introduced deposit insurance. We had an enormous e expansion of specialized housing finance, which is going to be relevant for uh, the next crisis. It's also the origins, for example, of, uh, of, of Fannie Mae. The Fed uh, uh, got, uh, there were amendments to the Federal Reserve Act to expand its powers to be able to, to respond. And then um, we had um, uh, a form of the, the gold standard continuing on the Bretton Woods system until it collapsed in 72. Um, central banks were unfettered, but then the new, uh, quote, fetter uh, would be inflation targeting, which some people have been very critical of. Um, this is a long history of housing politics. It goes back to, um, this is Frank Capra's It's a Wonderful Life in the 1940s. But as you'll notice here, this is from a, uh, a savings loan from the 1930s and says, own your own home. So this politics, uh, this, uh, this politics about housing and support for housing goes back a very long way. It's not something that's just in recent periods. Some people seem to think, well, it was something new. It's been around, I mean, it was in this 1946 movie and it was really, and you could see in the responses in the 1930s how important that, that was then. Uh, the, um, at now, thinking about uh, uh, the more recent financial crisis, who do we blame? Go back to the bankers again, misconduct, misrepresentation, mis misrepresentation, fraud, and now moral hazard. There wasn't much of a discussion of moral hazard in the old days because there really wasn't much of a safety net that was there, so there was really not much opportunity to discuss that, and really not much evidence of something like that, because it was the big banks that survived and did relatively well, because they were slightly more diversified than the small banks. Remember, we lost about a third of the banking system, almost 10,000 banks, in during the, the Great Depression, so the narrative was very different back then. Here, the narrative is very different, that you've got too big to fail, you've got this, this um, moral hazard safety net that, that came around. Fed, of course, people, I won't point at Ben again, uh, the monetary policy here. So we had too, long for, uh, too low for too long in the early 2000s, leading to excess credit growth. Um, also inflation targeting, that uh, the focus was too much, too narrowly on the level of, uh, of consumer, inflation, consumer price inflation, rather than focusing more broadly on, on asset prices and uh, underemphasizing financial stability. The regulators being asleep at the switch that allowed for excess lev leverage and sufficient liquidity, and too narrow of a focus on uh, and ignoring the macroprudential issues and the shadows. And then I also introduce here uh, this fourth broader narrative on housing policy and political economy, uh, that uh, things like uh, in the US, the Community Reinvestment Act, or the GSEs, um, su subsidizing housing, um, uh, especially uh, interacting with the global savings glut, leading to too much um, uh, misallocation, of, uh, of, uh, uh, misallocation of investment. Responses, um, the Volcker Rule uh, came in. Uh, that's something that I think is, uh, I wouldn't agree with this, uh, this narrative uh, because I think if you look both globally as well as in the US, it wasn't that um, uh, large banks were taking on excess risk by getting into these, uh, these other, um, uh, these other um, quote, betting markets. Um, it was housing finance done really badly. Those were the institutions that they got into trouble. So for, from my point of view, the Volcker Rule is a solution in search of a problem, but it comes from a very different narrative. A lot of people have focused on that in, in the narratives. Orderly liquidation authority trying to deal with uh, the institutions that got into trouble. Fed's monetary policy, the response has been to curtail some of the emergency powers, to intervene and broaden the financial stability mandate. I won't go through the details of Dodd-Frank, Basel III, but interestingly, legislation last week has raised the cutoff for stress tests for, for largest banks and sort of rolled back a little bit of, uh, of Dodd-Frank, at least as, uh, a little bit of Volcker rule, at least as it applies to smaller institutions. Housing policy, uh, one of the things that I think is a bit of a tragedy is that I think virtually everyone agrees that housing had something to do with the crisis, and what have we done? Nothing, except to make the GSCs a larger fraction of the, uh, uh, a larger fraction of the, uh, uh, the housing finance market. Um, 
So this brings us to the alternative channels and uh, of, of crises. So um, the, the Friedman kind of approach with traditional bank runs, collapse of the money multiplier, money supply deflation, um, collapse of the payment system. A lot of discussion yesterday of, of credit channel, financial accelerator, these modern bank runs, where we think about the different layers of intermediation, as Ben had talked about, um, uh, the cost of external finance. Ben had done some interesting work here on um, uh, trying to uh, identify panic factors uh, that sort of, um, once you have this sort of fragile structure, if you get um, this, this sort of shock that can lead you into a bad situation, um, drawing on sort of uh, uh, Guillermo Calvo's work, effectively we had sudden stops in uh, wholesale funding and securitized, uh, securitized credit, um, and then uh, that in interacting with insufficient capital and uh, the excess maturity mismatch that we had talked about yesterday. And um, I, won't, uh, I won't go over these, these other pieces. Also something that interestingly came up yesterday was insufficient debt restructure, and I want to come, come back to that. Um, I'll just quickly mention the Euro crisis, uh, although um, Barry already mentioned this. Um, and, in, in and, and in Europe, li like in the US, when we don't know who to blame, we blame the, uh, w the French. In Europe, when people don't know who to blame, they blame the Germans. And so uh, the Germans are often blamed uh, for, uh, for part of the Euro crisis. Directions for future research, you know, Ben emphasizes the useful of the recent financial crisis as a natural experiment. Barry uh, looks at history and looking globally. We can kind of cross those two things, and I want to look briefly at a natural experiment from the 1920s and 30s about debt forgiveness. So there was an enormous um, change in uh, the, the debt burdens that came from uh, a Supreme Court decision in, uh, 19, in the 1930s, which uh, abrogated the so-called gold clauses. Virtually all debt in the United States had this clause in it that said that if um, that you would uh, be repaid not just in the dollars that you were contracted for, but the gold value of those those dollars. The U.S. goes off of the gold standard and uh, devalues by 69 percent. So people showed up and said, "Well, I want a dollar 69," and that was true whether it was Federal Reserve notes that were uh, gold notes. It was true if you had, uh, had bonds. So you wanted a 69% nominal increase. This was a time where the price level had fallen by about a third. That's devastating. You know, we had enough bankruptcies as it was. If you had another increase of 69%, that would be really, really problematic. And this was big. Uh, it would have basically increased the amount of debt burden by the size of GDP. So this is not, not trivial. Congress then nullifies the enforcement of the gold clauses, resulting in a massive debt forgiveness. But of course, people, what do you do in the US? Everybody sues. And so you go to the Supreme Court. Um, there's a uh, major focus on this front page headline in the New York Times just the day, uh, the day of the, uh, the decision. Capital tense experts uh, decision on uh, gold today. Leaders are confident, but there's no indication of what the Supreme Court will decide. Landmark 5-4 decision, uh, the, the dissent by Justice McReynolds. He reads his dissent. He's shaking so red. He puts the paper down and says, the Constitution is gone. Now, you would think that that might disrupt the, um, you know, contractual enforcement. Interestingly, what happened, well, no surprise equities surge because you've gotten rid of this debt overhang on the equities. But the thing when I did this research that shocked me is that debt prices rose. So I double checked that, triple checked that, because it's certainly not what I, what I expected. And then I looked in the cross section and found out that the securities of firms with lower ratings and more debt were the ones that benefited the most. So that's, that's very uh, consistent with very high debt cost, very high costs of, of debt renegotiation, and also the broader uh, debt deflation concerns, because everyone, even those who didn't have debt outstanding, um, had a benefit, uh, uh, seemed to get a benefit from this. And I think it's, it's interesting to think about what are the implications for debt restructuring or forgiveness, because we, of course, allow for debt restructuring and forgiveness on the private side. Uh, that happens all the time. That's a natural thing. But did we have a structure in the 1930s that allowed us to do a, uh, a restructuring easily? Certainly not. And I think one of the reasons that it worked in the US, and I think these things have been very problematic, for example, like in Argentina, is that this was relatively clean, straightforward, and kind of got us to the result that I think individual negotiations would have gotten us to without having to go through the costs of bankruptcy. I think when you do things like asymmetric pacification in Argentina, where you pick winners, you pick losers, you uh, reallocate through a political process, that's much more problematic. Um, I'm not gonna go through this, just quickly with the lessons, alternative narratives of the crisis, when to think about when government and central bank action can help or hurt. Um, 
have the private incentives changed? Is there a too big to fail issue? S some things we continue to, to discuss. More or less power for the uh, for central banks. They've been given some additional powers in some cases. Other cases taken taken things away, like with 13.3. I think the Volcker and structural reforms. I'm not sure that they actually address a real problem. Um, housing reforms have not not occurred, and I think uh, a very interesting debate is think about what circumstances would debt restructuring be, be effective, and how do you do that in a way that doesn't engender the moral hazard problem that could make uh, the, the probability of getting into the bad equilibrium that Olivier talked about worse. Thanks. <laughs>